Uh, Veer Sangvi, thank you so much for being with me on the note. I'm going to start off by asking you that it's it's going to be nearly two years of the second term of Narendra Modi. What do you think has its has been its single biggest achievement and its single biggest failure? I think its single biggest achievement, whether you like him or not, has to be that no matter how bad the pandemic got, not that many Indians died that there appears now to be some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Perhaps the economy will recover if these projections are right. And a lot Mm. of countries have been completely down by the pandemic. And you must give the government and the administration, despite many unforgivable missteps, to for the fact that India seems to have come out of this little bloody, but still unbowed. I think that's his biggest achievement. His biggest lack of achievement or non-achievement, if you want to call it that, is that in the first term, he was largely content to be what he had promised us in that election campaign, which is a development-focused prime minister. In the second term, he seems to have adopted more of the social agendas that really got him elected and more of the hardline steps that people thought no Indian prime minister would do. Kashmir is, of course, one example. This whole thing about the CA is another example. And then the stereotyping of farmers as being anti-national has turned what is probably a perfectly reasonable economic measure into an us and them matter. So in sum, yes, he got us through the pandemic and he deserves credit for that. But he has become more polarizing than before. And India can't survive if it's polarized from the top. I'm going to come to that polarizing a uh, bit in uh, in just a few questions as we go along. But he's still seen as one of perhaps one of the most popular prime ministers that we've had. Uh, do you think that's because he's doing it right? He's reaching the grassroots level. He's delivering on the promises he's made, except for the ones that you just mentioned. Or is it because there's lack of any other leader that even comes close to him? It's a combination of factors, my I think we read about Indian politics and identity politics for years now. We've said, for instance, that Mayavati will have a Dalit base, that Mulayam Singh Yadav, for example, or Lalu, will have a Yadav base, and that these bases will vote for people regardless of how they perform or what they do, because the very act of voting for that person is a reassertion of that identity. Mr. Modi will go down in history as being the one prime minister who managed what everyone thought was impossible. He weaponized the Hindu vote. Hindus vote, the overwhelming majority in this country, and should therefore be completely secure and not under any threat, somehow feel the need to have somebody up there who represents them. So no matter what Mr. Modi does, Mm. people vote for him because of what little the identity. And if Hindus are nearly 80% of the country, 75, 80% of the country, then even if every single minority votes against him, how does it matter? But you say he's weaponized the Hindu vote. At the same hmm. time, the opposition is in tatters. Uh, there's also a massive machinery that's at work as far as the BJP is concerned. I mean, whether it's a municipal election, whether it's DDC, any election, they look at it as the final battle and they approach it in that manner. What will the opposition have to do in order to get its act together and fight uh, this lean, mean machine that the BJP has become, this winning machine? I think when you have elections that are sought, spot on everyday affairs, the organization, the nature of the machine becomes all important. Congress pendants, but when Mrs. Gandhi broke with the Congress organization and formed her own Congress with virtually no organization at all, she still won and she won by a landslide. Hmm. During the emergency, when Mrs. Gandhi had everybody tapped and everybody sewn up, she still lost by a landslide. So machines work when other factors are equal. And clearly the BJP has created the finest election winning machine that India has ever seen. But equally, machines will only work if there are no other factors. You mentioned one of those factors, which is the lack of an opposition alternative. I think that's correct. But essentially, Mr. Modi has captured the hearts and minds of, in, of Indian voters in a way that nobody has before him, not even in the realm. 
you know, we see a, almost like a presidential form of, uh, um, you know, campaigning when it comes to the prime minister or when it comes to Lok Sabha. At least that's what, uh, what the BJP and Modi has done. Now, on the other hand, we're looking at the Congress because after all, how can we forget the Congress, the oldest party yeah. in the country, and also uh, for the longest time uh, in power and a strong opposition at that. But today, it seems because of the lack of leadership, uh, uh, it's it's lost for lack of a better word. How much do you hold Rahul Gandhi responsible for where the Congress is? Well, first things first, I believe that even if the Congress had got its act together, Mr. Modi has a more powerful message, he would still have won. So mm -hmm. I don't want to attribute Mr. Modi's success to the Congress's failings. Th those achievements are Mr. Modi's own. The Congress's mm -hmm. failings, however, are clearly apparent. After UPA 2, when Rahul led the Congress to its worst ever victory, uh, defeat, then we thought that it's not his fault. He's got the baggage of UPA 2. He should present himself with a new face, a new identity. When he lost a second time, roughly the same sort of margin, obviously anybody who looked at politics said, what are they going to do now? What is their strategy? And the worrying thing is that there is no strategy. Rahul announced, I thought very kindly and gracefully that he would step down, that the party needed to find the president, that it wouldn't be a member of his family. So far, so good. But then what happened? You don't have, you dis crack down on dissent. Very senior people within the party are made to feel isolated. And mm. to this day, they are now talking about elections in May, when Indian democracy is facing many tests, when your old existence at a par as a party is in doubt. Can you really mm. afford to take it so easy? You know, he's being told that he's taking it too easy. Right. Uh, at the same time, there is nobody else in the party that seems to be taking the mantle forward. Uh, how does it work within a party? Is there lack of intra-party democracy? Um, is he the only factor that is bringing the Congress down? Or is it just the Gandhi name that helps the Congress work that without him, there is no Congress party? I think the Congress, unlike the BJP, which is a Carter-based party. The Congress has not, in recent years, even when it was in power for 10 years, been an organized party. It's essentially collections of individuals who sort of vaguely secular, who come together because they believe the Congress will help them win, will get them power. The moment it becomes clear that the Congress cannot help you win, cannot bring you any kind of power, then people lose any enthusiasm they may have had for the Congress or the leadership, even in constituencies, the voters are not brought to the polling booths, nobody bothers to campaign, because all the political workers who were part of the Congress are now defected to what they see as greener pastures. So the Congress structure has not been a BJP debt structure, which depends on an organization. It's been enthusiastic volunteers who think that they're fighting for a cause. At the moment, alas, nobody wants to fight for a lost cause. Hmm. You know, you started off by saying when I asked you about what is the uh, biggest achievement of the Narendra Modi government, you said uh, a non-achievement perhaps is the fact that he's being seen largely as a polarizing figure, right? Hmm. Uh, right. So the country seems to be more polarized than ever before. A yeah. lot of commentators say that we've always been polarized, uh, polarized. It's just that now the fault lines are quite exposed. Do you agree with that? Do you, do you believe that we were always very polarized or divided on religious grounds, on other grounds, but it's just that now with social media and the advent of easy technology, we're seeing this? No, we were polarized till the 1940s. That is how the British managed to rule India through divide and rule. Every mm. politician of consequence who came after independence, worked to heal those divides, to bridge those gaps, to say, yes, there are historical enmities. Yes, there are historical divisions, but we must find a way to work together. This is the first government that's not made that effort. Hmm. So yesterday, the prime minister spoke in parliament and he spoke, of, uh, used this word, Andolan Jeevi. Almost in a way, many commentators said that he was mocking dissent. Uh, 
has the prime minister indicated that the government is going to go after anybody who raises his or her voice or anybody who doesn't agree with any of the policies did you get that sense from what the prime minister said not just from what he said from what other B- bjp spokesmen have been seeing the kind of hysterical almost comical overreaction to a tweet from rihana there is a sense that after months of pressure from the farmers and a huge miscalculation in backing donald trump who lost the election things are wearing slightly out of control they don't quite know what to do so they're striking out in all directions but um, uh, andolan gv comes in context of what they did with the farm laws do you believe that the modi shah combine got it wrong when it comes to the farm laws and do you see that they still have a way out of it okay first just one quick point that andolan gv is actually all right compared to what arun jetli who we all hate as a great great liberal called anybody criticize the government he called mm. them urban naxals mm. no suggestion being there so there is a long history of the bjp bad mouthing anybody who attempts to present an alternative point of view it didn't start yesterday with mr modi it started before that as for the farmers yes i mm. think they completely mishandled it i think people often forget that the modi wave which swept north india was halted at the punjab border for some reason mr modi never actually managed to take his popularity into punjab the battle there is still a congress akali battle with aap trying to make some kind of inroad so the bjp had no real interest in or understanding of punjab and there was possibly a fatal calculation which was that even if these guys are angry and they vote against us how does it matter we are not going to win punjab anyway hmm. also i mean this is an unfortunate truth but it suits much of mr modi's constituency at least hardcore constituency when the people who are protesting are not hindus So if you see the early criticisms of the farmers the terms and terms like separatist khalistani anti national we used all the time this was not just part of the cause also dangerous because there was a referendum 2020 organized by pakistan based khalistani sikhs there is a huge global effort to try and separate the sikh community and to raised the specter of the last 1980 seek agitation again the chief minister of punjab has been warning again and again about how much money is being poured into this both by nri seeks and he says by isi so when you have such a delicate situation the worst thing you can do is to call people who are standing who are sitting there braving the cold at night flying indian flags saying they're patriotic and to say because you have a turban on your head you are anti national you are separatist you are against the idea of india now i'm willing to accept that mr modi and mr shah never actually said those things but there is no doubt they did not stop their social media trolls people lower down the line saying that i think once you frame that debate in terms of if you agree with my farm laws you are an indian if you disagree with them you are a khalistani then you are heading for trouble but uh, that was still uh, uh, you know sikhs were largely a part of or they were uh, the main faces of this protest now with the jars joining in do you think that electorally or politically also it's become uh, almost like a ticking bomb for the bjp absolutely i think there was a lot of relief i'm sure they were all very sad about the red fort incursion about the sikh flag mm-hmm. being raised etc but at some level i think within the government there, there was a sense that these people have now screwed it for themselves india will turn against them they will see this as an anti india movement and i think till about the 27th that sense of relief lasted when it became clear that the kayat was now becoming the face of the movement and that it was up farmers and they were not going to be intimidated then it becomes a very serious matter because while the bjp doesn't really win any seats from punjab it mm. wins much of its parliamentary majority from uttar pradesh the yes. moment uttar pradesh farmers turn against you you have a huge huge problem so now i'm pretty sure they're trying to find some graceful way out also i think we mentioned this mm. before the internationalization has hurt them. mr modi spent much of his first term as an international statesman he went from country to country hugged many foreign leaders became big pals with donald trump and he even said in his speeches when he spoke to nris now you can be proud of india again so this was a very large part of what he mm. wanted 
that seems to be slipping away now which i think has contributed to his anger which is what i wanted to come to that you know the uh, the fact that Uh, the problem has now been internationalized um, domestically what you do for a domestic constituency can still be contained but when you have the mea releasing a statement and when you have international stars talking about it clearly that's something that the bjp would not want and neither to show india in that light absolutely and mr modi's original constituency let's not forget was new jersey he was mm. the candidate of many nri gujaratis who pushed him even when mr advani was the token leader of the bjp who said we will be proud to have a leader like modi you don't hear very much from that bridge and tunnel crowd any longer in fact all polls show that the vast majority of nri's indian origin pios that say rather nri's pios in the us actually voted against trump so that link that there was between the you and the us community in america and mr modi seems to be slightly symbolic at the moment plus the issue has now got internationalized and when an issue gets internationalized it loses in wants people are just told you know farmers are being discriminated against you must fight so the government may well have a valid story to tell and say it's not that simple but twitter is not the right platform sloganeering is not the right platform so the government judging by the nature of that comical mea response is in a in a quandary and the huge huge disadvantage in getting its position across you know and then on the other hand you have people like raj thakre who say why did you use and he's alleging this why did you use bharat ratnas like sachin tendulkar and lata mangeshkar to put these tweets out supporting the country and then the maharashtra government promptly decides to have its uh, 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 you know these tweets probed as to why these celebrities were asked to now there's a huge huge allegation there in terms of suggesting that these people have not tweeted on their own but have been given a toolkit of sorts from the government uh, to put these tweets out what do you make of that i think that lata mangeshkar and sachin tendulkar are grown up individual if somebody asks them to tweet they have every right to say no if they choose not to say no for whatever reason it's their own decision it does not become a police case or a police matter unless you can show that they were coerced or that they were bribed as far as i know there is evidence suggesting either of those things so the maharashtra government investigation is dangerous and sets a very bad precedent let me come to the judiciary now veer i mean uh, increasingly yeah. there seems to be a lack of trust uh, in the judicial uh, framework it is one of the most important pillars of our democracy uh, had that kind of credibility but that seems to be going down i mean we have a comedian munawar farooq who has to finally go to the highest court of the land to get bail for a joke he never cracked uh, do you see this fear, fear growing especially amongst the marginalized and the uh, minority communities on whether they'll get a fair trial or not oh absolutely I think if you see videos of the Delhi police forcing a person to sing the national anthem and assaulting him, the police, by the way, have now said one year later that they can't identify officers who were clearly visible in the video. When you have that sense that if your last name is not a good Hindu name, that mm. you are more likely to be arrested or to be persecuted, it's a very dangerous thing for India. Any political party. which had an interest in depolarizing the situation and uniting mm. india would make some attempt to remove this far from mm. removing those fears we have introduced things like two states and possibly more now things like love jihad legislation which is surely an invitation to penalize muslims to create problems for them and you can argue that they have to register it etc but we know what the reality in india is it's just another stick to beat the minorities with Mr Modi believes that because his support is don't mind this because despite all of this legislation he still wins it by huge majorities and that even if the muslims are unhappy they don't count electorally all of that is correct but politics is not just about winning elections of course you need to win elections but once you won the election you need to govern you need to rule the problem with this government is it hasn't come to the obvious conclusion which is that all democracy ultimately no matter what your majority is is ultimately a coalition you have to take into account the views of people who didn't vote for you 
people who don't agree with you. And they have to feel that there's enough of a stake in the country because even if they don't agree with the party in power, there is some way in which their interests are being catered to, represented or addressed. We are now in a situation where that's mm -hmm. not happening. And if you have a government that enjoys majority triumphalism and tells the minorities you don't have a voice in India, very soon you're going to have a new generation of minorities saying, do we have a stake in it? Hmm. Quite somber, those words make me <laughs> very somber. Uh, let me move yeah. to the media and where journalism stands today. Right. Yeah. We see what is happening. We see how, uh, uh, you know, senior journalists are being persecuted. Um, apart from the fact I, I read a recent piece of yours where you say the TV model is dead, right? Because nobody has the money to send reporters out. And that's why it's only debates yeah. that we see most of the times. Um, where do you see journalism, Indian journalism, as far as the credibility index goes? I don't even think Indian journalism wants to be credible any longer. I think there are a few newspapers that are surviving given the present state of the economy and the present state of global journalism, mm. and which do stand up for values. But when it comes to, say, the electronic media, it no longer takes its to the BBC or from CNN or even from print media. Electronic media now takes its cues from social media. On many of these television channels, the scripts are no more than WhatsApp forwards and the anchors are no more than trolls. So if you treat social media, direct media as the same thing, which is how I look at it, then the standards that were normally applied to journalism clearly no longer apply there. As for the print media and a very tiny section of the electronic media, it's difficult now in this landscape to survive. The future ultimately is going to have to be shows like yours on outlets like this, because I don't think the era of mass media will survive for very long. It will be an area of media broken up into smaller things like this. But what makes you speak your mind? I'm very curious to know that what makes uh, senior columnists uh, like you speak your mind, given the kind of acute uh, scanner that you find yourselves under. I mean, any word, one word this way or that, and you could be in trouble. Yeah, I guess I should be more aware of that than <laughs> I am. But I mean, I've spent my life writing and fighting not for political parties, but for the certain liberal values, secular values on which this country was built. It's a bit late to stop now. <laughs> in the end, I want to give my uh, listeners a more hopeful note, uh, Veer. Uh, I mean, uh, we are still, a, I would like to say that we are uh, still a democracy. What is, what is it that's still keeping us intact? Uh, I mean, there has to be hope somewhere. Yeah, I think there are reasons for hope. I think if Mr. Modi was, say, Vladimir Putin or he was... Erdogan or someone, he wouldn't worry about the international uproar. The fact that our politicians, no matter what they say, still seem to care for public opinion, whether it's Indian public opinion, which it must be, because otherwise they wouldn't be taking action against journalists, or it's international public opinion, means that while the disenfranchised are probably outnumbered at the ballot boxes, voices are being heard for everything we say about Indian democracy being dead or whatever. The reality is that Indian politicians do care what people say. They may react in all kinds of unsavory ways or stupid ways sometimes. But we are, in a sense, unusual amongst countries with strong men leaders because our leader does seem to care what people think. And I think at some level, he does want public approval. That is always a hopeful sign. Okay, Veer Sangvi for your wonderful insights into where we stand today. Thank you so much for joining me on The Note. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it.